to follow up on our excellent panel of veterans who have been covering conventions for decades, we have now what I call the newbie panel. Uh, these are all reporters who covered their first convention in 2012. They're going to be coming at it from three different perspectives. Uh, Tracy, I, I, Myrella, Mariello. Mariello, I apologize That's for that. Mariello from the Pittsburgh Post Gazette is going to be coming talking about it from a you know regional newspaper reporter's perspective. Christina Wilkie from the Huffington Post uh, is going to talk about it from you know from a digital perspective. She covered both conventions in um, in 2012 and talking about the the, the nonstop real time demands that she was under. And uh, Ginger Gibson from Reuters was with Politico at the time. She was the Romney embed, and she's going to talk about what it was like to be covering the GOP convention, but from the, the perspective of being inside the Romney bubble. Christina was outside the Romney bubble, and she has some pretty interesting stories to tell. Ginger was inside it. So we will start with uh, Tracy. Um, hi. Um, tough act to follow since the last speakers were been, all been to numerous conventions, and I've only been to two. Um, but um, I think the reason that I was asked to speak here is that um, I did a blog last year um, about the experience of covering a convention for the first time. So I'm going to try not to repeat too much of what's in the blog, but I understand it's on the NPF website. And it's just um, probably not the best writing because I wrote all the blog posts after having filed two daily stories and several news posts um, online for our paper. So these are all sort of like middle of the night, this is what I did today sort of posts. But it, I think it could give you an idea of uh, the rhythm of covering um, a convention. Um, to save you from reading it, it's exhausting. That's kind of basically what you need to know. Um, so I wanted to, um, I just have a few uh, tips. The first um, is to plan ahead, and I think some of the other speakers uh, talked about that earlier. Um, when I went um, in 2012, I actually had six enterprise pieces, three for each convention, that were basically reported before I even got there. Um, I did a lot of my reporting before I got there and then just topped it off with what was actually happening in the moment. Um, particularly for the Democratic convention, it's very scripted. There's not going to be a lot of surprises. I can't say the same thing for Cleveland. Um, but I think that you could really do a lot of your work before you even get there. Um, so I guess my advice would be, especially if you're like a one-man show or a two-man show, um, don't waste your time doing stuff on site that you could have done before you got there. Because um, you're going to want to be a lot of places at the same time. Um, there's tons and tons of stuff going on. Um, so you should really make a game plan of where you want to go. A lot of times you won't know what the events are until you actually get there. But I just wanted to give you an idea, um, and I'll just I'll pass this around. I do want it back. I saved this from Tampa. This is actually the um, schedule just for the Pennsylvania delegation of all the events that they had going on. I mean, they were busy like morning till night. So just to give you sort of an idea, if anybody wants to see it. Um, Oh, I also just wanted to mention about hotels, since that was uh, mentioned. Um, the national committees allocate a certain number of rooms to each state's delegation. And some delegations, Pennsylvania does this, um, will set aside rooms for reporters. So you can actually book through them. Um, I don't know if every state does this, but it's worth it to ask. Um, it was super convenient for us, because we've always stayed at the same convention as our delegation. Um, I did a lot of writing in the lobby of the hotel and people would just walk by and I would say hey I need a quote for my story that I'm writing right now there you are come here um, so I mean it was uh, super convenient to have that kind of access um, you'll also find if you're from if you're from a Pennsylvania paper um, Laura <laughs> our hotel is going to be um, a, a lot closer in Philly and if you're from the Cleveland Plain Dealer you're going to be super close or, or the Columbus Dispatch they do um, try to keep the uh, delegations from the closest to the hotel um, if it's hosted by your state or if um, the nominee is from your state um, you'll you'll be a lot closer um, the other thing that our delegation does that I don't know if all of them do um, they they let us uh, kind of glom on to their package of food and shuttle services. Um, so there are, the, the National Convention does have a shuttle bus system, but the delegations also sometimes have their own. 
Um, so we paid, I think it was like $150 a person, and we could take their shuttle service, including getting somebody to pick us up and take us back to the airport. Um, they also had a hospitality room at the hotel where you could just pop in. There was food there all the time. You can grab you know, a hot dog on the go. Um, I don't know if every delegation does that. And I don't know how it looks optically. People might say, oh, geez, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette is eating all their sources food. We actually pay for it. Um, so you could check with your delegation about that. Um, I'd also say have backup equipment and backup filing plans. Um, wireless is going to be really overloaded. Um, so just, I was actually fine in 2012 for the most part, but I understand that some photographers in particular had trouble transmitting stuff just because everybody was trying to tweet and send photos and everything all at the same time. So have backups and backups for your backups. Um, if you're a regional reporter and a member of the Regional Reporters Association, we might um, be working on sort of a backup uh, that folks could chip in on. But the, we're, we're not ready to watch that, are we? Herb? So. Not yet. <laughs> we have a quorum here. Do you guys want to vote? <laughs> um, regional reporters, we, we might have a backup for you, so be on the lookout for that if you're a regional. Last, pack everything you need, nothing you don't, because you don't want to... Um, you're, you have to walk a lot. <laughs> um, I just put up a few pictures so that you could see what your actual workspace is going to look like. Um, <laughs> you recognize folks in there? I recognize the guy on the picture. Nice. Who could that be? <laughs> um, so this is basically your workspace. This is in um, uh, Tampa at the RNC in 2012. Um, there's also a similar space on the other side of the stage. Um, and there's TV, big TV monitors there so that you can kind of see what's going on. Um, There's another shot of the workspace. That's my personal little workspace, so that was kind of my view um, at the RNC. Uh, the DNC was a little bit different. Um, we had uh, little TV monitors at every seat or maybe every other seat, so that was kind of convenient. You can see this is early in the day. There's not very many people there, but smart reporters who showed up early. There's my little spot in the DNC. Um, floor passes, which um, John Mulligan talked about already. Um, I don't know how much more there is to say about that, except be really nice to the gallery staff. They work super hard. Like, I don't know how they coordinate all of that. Um, but if they tell you, here, you can have a pass for 20 minutes, don't bring it back two hours later because when you want to pass the next day or four years later, you might end up going to another convention. They will remember if you uh, really hog the floor passes. Um, they're pretty organized. And if you tell them ahead of time, hey, you know, somebody from my state or somebody is speaking on an issue that I cover all the time, I really need to make sure that I'm on the floor for this. They'll make sure that you are. Um, so just be nice. Um, Contrary to the name, a floor pass will not get you access here, which is, uh, you'll find reporters just hold up in any old spot that they can find to work. This is something that you probably all really want to know about. Um, there will be food everywhere. People are whining and dining. Um, the trouble is that um, I, you're not going to be able to partake <laughs> because either ethical reasons um, or um, because you're just busy, you're covering the speech or whatever. So you're gonna probably end up with a lot of grab and go food. Um, and there is that in the convention center. It's like typically what you would find at a sporting event, hot dogs, pretzels, stuff like that. Um, so I do suggest that you bring some healthier types of snacks because even at those vending areas, the line might be super long and you might not be able to get back to file your story on time. So if you plan proper snacks, you won't have to eat like this, which is some of my meals from the conventions. <laughs> so if that doesn't inspire you to plan ahead your food, I don't know what will. Um, then I had a, a few story ideas. Um, and I'll just go through them quickly, because I think we talked about them already. Um, know who your delegates are. You might find a story about the um, oldest delegate, I found a father and son delegate combo that I did a story on uh, four years ago. I also, somebody was telling me, a bunch of delegates were telling me about um, this one fellow delegate who had just been to 
conventions going back forever, and they told me that I should look for him and talk to him. I looked and looked and looked and spent like days trying to find this guy, and I finally found him. He was super talkative. Um, and by the time he got done telling me about all the conventions he knew about, he finally told me that he had seen them all on television. So, <laughs> yeah, so it wasn't really that helpful. Um, you can also do a story on volunteers with unusual jobs. I've always been curious about who blows up the balloons that all come down um, at the end of the convention. Um, so you could find uh, someone, um, especially if you're a regional reporter, you can try to find somebody, a volunteer from your area that's doing something kind of unusual. Um, the McGovern reforms um, were discussed a little bit earlier um, as far as rules for delegate counts, but it also changed the diversity of the conventions. Before 1968, you would go to these conventions and it would be like all white men there. And after the McGovern reforms, they said, no, no, it has to be more reflective of the actual party. So um, you could look at how the McGovern reforms played out. I did that story four years ago and talked to some pretty cool people. Um, you could also work on a story on the timing of this, camp this convention. It's a lot earlier, so that's going to leave a lot more um, time for campaign season. Um, you could look at street vendors and the kitsch that they're selling. You could also look at pin trading. Um, a lot of delegations will bring state pins um, and then trade them. So I'll give you a, a Pennsylvania pin if you give me an Oklahoma pin. Um, so there's people that collect them, and it can be kind of a fun story. Um, and then some of the delegate delegations also plan like what they wear. Um, so that's sort of interesting for your um, photographers. So you can see some of the kind of crazy outfits um, that they wore. Um, then I would also say that you should get out of the convention center. There's lots of stories to be had in the convention center, but um, a lot of that your readers and viewers can watch on network news. So try to show them stuff that they're not going to see on TV, something that only you can show them. Um, am I running out? Oh, no, good. All right. Good, soon, I guess. Soon, soon. OK, I think I only have a couple more slides. Um, to find people outside of the convention center, this is like my little uh, tip. I just keep this on the back of my backpack, and you'd be surprised that people actually find me and I get stories out of it. Um, outside the convention you'll definitely find some protests particularly um, at the Republican convention. Um, I think they'll probably be a bit more intense than they were four years ago. As you can see the guy in orange here is actually a protester and he's negotiating with the police over where they can walk and where they can be. Um, but I think you might find more like this in Cleveland. I hope not. These are actually photos from the G20 in Pittsburgh where there were some crazy riots. Um, and I can give you advice on uh, surviving that sort of atmosphere if you like, but I'm going to move ahead. <laughs> actually, OK, here's my tip, because you asked the question. Um, my paper actually issued us gas masks for the G20. Don't wear gas masks. Don't wear bandanas, because then you look like a protester. You look like a troublemaker, and you become a target for police. So, and also don't look too nice and fancy because then you become a target for the protesters. <laughs> so, I don't know. <laughs> um, so, at the end of the convention, uh, you'll leave with lots of memories and of beautiful balloons coming down. Um, so, I hope you see a lot more of that than this because it's more fun. Okay. Okay. So, uh, yeah, Christina? Sure. So when I did my first convention four years ago, I'd only been a journalist for four years. I was very new to politics, and I had no access. I had no embargoed copies of speeches. I had no party insiders with connections to tell me anything. So I want to talk about three things that I learned the hard way. You also said you learned things the hard way. Uh, firstly, how I let go of the sense that I needed to cover all the main attractions. I was like the 12 millionth reporter in each of these cities. And initially it was depressing, but it turned out to be liberating. I'd also want to tell you how to prepare your go bag and how to plan for a few contingencies. Lastly, I want to encourage you all to get out of the convention center because there are some great stories out in these cities. So here's what I wish someone had told me. 
Firstly, the readers who are following the conventions online have an almost insatiable appetite for anything that you can post. So, you know, I could send in, especially at HuffPost, we live blogged the conventions. So I could send in a photograph of a lady selling pins. I could send in a picture of a weird guy or a funny quote I overheard. And they would just be added to the live blog and readers would love it. Um, if you're like I was in 2012, understand that you won't be writing the main story of the speech. So that's, that was left at HuffPost to much more senior reporters. So I didn't, I, I would have wasted my time if I had stood around and carefully taken notes on Mitt Romney's acceptance speech, for instance. I also didn't have embargoed copies, which most senior reporters do. So I remember marveling at how the senior reporters at HuffPost the minute the speaker said, I'm so glad to be here, they would file this complicated thousand word story on the speech. And I'm like typing desperately. And you know, I la obviously I later learned they'd had the speech for a month. Um, so yes, so don't waste time recording a speech that 10,000 other reporters have, are already writing on. Um, the upside is that you, sometimes you don't even have to pay that much attention to the speeches, which can be very boring. Um, you're not part of the herd if you're reporting digitally, if you're, I mean, as I wasn't part of the herd, I was a young reporter without much access. So instead, I would say focus on the fact that you're there in person. Look for what the TV cameras and the embedded reporters miss because they can't mingle. Try to watch the crowd and the VIPs and recognize people's faces. Carry a congressional Facebook so you can recognize the faces of members of Congress. You may re recognize that someone looks like someone you know from TV, but you want to verify who they are. There's a great app for that called Congress in Your Pocket, um, where you can so search both by state and by name um, for members and find out more about them to give context. But um, in Tampa, for instance, I caught Scott Walker crying because somebody said something so moving. And as we all know, he's a you know, notorious hard ass. So that was a short story, but it gave people, a someone else was talking and another reporter was writing the story of what the person on stage was writing. And, but I was looking at the crowd and I caught the reaction. And so sometimes reactions can actually tell you more about the party and the candidate and the general sense of the convention than listening to the speeches. Um, and even if you can't make a whole story out of the crowd, remember also that you can contribute a, a crowd, a couple of graphs, to the senior reporter at your outlet who is writing the big speech story. And so even if you don't think you got anything good, these can be graphs that someone will really appreciate at your outlet. Um, so check out the afternoon speakers. Um, they are often, you've never heard of them, they're kind of nobodies, but for someone, if you're not going to be getting the exclusive with Romney or with Donald Trump, um, they're all there for a reason, these afternoon speakers. And they had to be, you know, they had to beat out thousands of other people who wanted that speaking slot. Um, so what, who they are, it's not so much what they say. What they say is generally canned and boring. But who they are and why they matter to the party is often an interesting thing to look into. And if you do, you may find... You know, writing, I mean, I, I did some stories on, on uh, convention chairs. Oh, there's the Paul Ryan. Um, so yeah, I did a story on the DNC and the RNC's convention chairs, and I juxtaposed these two guys with the party's platforms of the conventions they were chairing. So the DNC chair was a Duke Energy chairman, um, and he, but he was a, becoming a little more of an environmentalist, so he was trying to jive with the Democratic platform. The Republican guy was like a textbook Romney, um, you know, rich, nice, fancy guy. Um, and but the Democrats had a field day with that. So you know, so I wrote about how this this uh, convention chairman, you know, only underscored some of the problems that people thought at the time about Romney. So. Um, if you can handle it physically, I would say go to the after parties and write party stories. Um, here's a quick rundown of how to try to get in if you don't have any invitations. Um, don't, uh, so check outlets like Politico, which are going to have um, generally as we get close a list of all the late night events. Don't reach out to the political campaigns or to the RNC or the DNC folks. Reach out to the companies that are sponsoring the parties. So the companies that are sponsoring them are paying a lot of money generally, and they might, you know, if they are publicly 
backing this stuff, they don't mind a little coverage. Whereas if you were to call, say, a me the member of Congress who's being honored at the event, um, his office doesn't necessarily want a bunch of, you know, a story about a bunch of parties. Um, if you do get into any of these parties, tweet pictures because people love don't you know people love these party pictures. They don't have to be of celebrities, just um, ambiance and the buffet table and what people are doing. And I think I went to see George Clinton um, at the DNC in Charlotte, and you know posted a little video. So there are people sitting at home, remember, in Schenectady and Wichita and Tampa, who are watching you know constantly following this coverage. So anything fun that you can give these people that puts them in the room. Um, at least for a digital outlet like HuffPost, um, was, was really valuable. So I have a couple of practical tips for digital media if you don't have as, that much access. Keep moving all day long. So you know about the Media Filing Center. Um, don't sit down there when all the other reporters in the morning sit down. Uh, wear, keep a backpack. Uh, ladies, don't carry a purse. Keep your wallet in your backpack so your hands are free. But don't park it at the media center necessarily, or you're going to get stuck there. Um, enter and exit the convention center when everyone else is watching the speeches. So try to get, or when no one's around. So early in the morning is great if you are, you know, an, an early bird. Um, but it's also, you know, it was, it's easy to get in at about two in the afternoon. Don't get caught in the lines. The lines are hideous. Um, they've got, you know, metal detectors and German shepherds and. I stood in line in Tampa in the roasting heat in the sun for, you know, the better part of an hour because someone had forgotten they had like a nail file in their purse. And so, you know, so the line stopped all of a sudden for an hour. Um, so think about, you know, when the big stuff is happening on TV, that's the time that you can move easily through this crowd. Um, and at the end of the night, when the, the chief, you know, when the, the headlining speaker of the night is talking, um, Download or stream his speech, his or her speech, on from C-SPAN onto your phone. Put it in your ear, earphones and get out of there about a half an hour or 45 minutes before everyone else, before they finish and everyone else leaves, because these buses are like the it's like a wedding party going you know to the reception times a thousand. So it's it's a thousand buses, and if you're you know in line and they each take 30 people and they go amazingly slowly. So in Tampa, I also stood outside for you know, the, more than an hour, I think, just waiting to be the you know, 6,000th person to get on one of these buses. Um, so here is a packing list. Pack like you'll be on a desert island, because once you get into the convention center, it's huge. You can't get out, and you can't, um, you, you, you're a solo operating system. Um, pack tons of AAA batteries for your tape recorder. Get an external battery pack to charge your phone or your laptop when there's no power outlet, which is often. Get a digital audio recorder for when your phone dies. If you can, get a Wi-Fi hotspot um, thing to, you know, to, because the, the Wi-Fi goes down all the time. Um, a telephone recording earpiece, uh, if that's something that you want. I've found them to be really useful because there's just a lot happening and if I was on the phone with someone, I often didn't want to miss what they were saying energy bars and solid food because a lot of the fun stuff at conventions happens during meal times. So it's this prime time, seven, eight o'clock, and you're you know, busting your tail and the food, whether or not you could even eat it, you don't have time and you're somewhere, you're, you know, all the other people you're talking to, they're gonna get a chance to eat later, but, or, you know, or before, but you're gonna be seeking people out all night long. So that was important. Um, so get a hard copy of that congressional Facebook and download Congress in your pocket. Um, don't drain your phone battery running on Twitter all, all day long or all night long um, and checking Twitter because basically the people, if you're in the convention hall and you're there, the people who are going to be tweeting and what you're going to read is, are the same people who are also generally in the convention hall. And you don't necessarily need, I mean, it, they'd be tweeting the kind of the same things. So think of yourself as a content producer at, one of, at these kinds of events and not a consumer. Um, you really, you will find, you know, download certainly the party's two apps, uh, the Democrats app and the Republicans app for the convention. But, you, you know, if you're there, um, you should be photographing and put, making up, putting a little updates in. Um, but if you're running thousands, I, I follow thousands of people on Twitter. If you're running that all day long, your phone's going to die before lunch. Um, so whenever you need your tech the most, it will fail. 
Um, we've all learned that. So yeah, carry a notebook and pens and a digital camera and a flash drive at all time. Bring your business cards. And then for, as a digital reporter, I, if you find yourself in a scrum um, with a ton of other reporters, step back and question whether you really should be there. Um, if there are other, if there are no reporters from your outlet, for instance, and there are no TV cameras, then the answer is probably yes, you should be there. Um, if there are two other guys from your bureau and three you know, of the big TV guys with their Grateful Dead t-shirts and filming a thing, um, then, you know, then you probably don't need to be there because it's, you know, it's nothing that's not gonna be on TV. Um, and in those, in those senses, um, yeah, get, I mean, get out of there. So, and don't be afraid to file really short stories um, and snippets because even if they don't, I mean, at HuffPost, they'd go on a live blog, but um, at other outlets, they'll go into someone else's story. They will, um, they'll fill in the context for, um, you know, in, in a day or two. So, you know, feed, continue feeding your bureau with um, as much as you can. And, uh, and don't, go f don't be afraid to go off on your own. Um, so think about what the city and its residents reveal about the party and about the convention and about the platform. Um, in, let's see. Which one do you want? Um, oh, that was an, I did a weather story in Tampa because the weather was the news. <laughs> um, that was, oh, that Nikki Haley speech, I threw up a, um, I just got the transcript and put it up. And, um, and that was an example of not very much re reporting, but because of this insatiable appetite that readers have who are following this, um, that was, it was just a workaday thing. It took me five minutes and people enjoyed it. Um, then the next, do we have the Charlotte, do we have the strip club story? Strip, yes, we of course have the strip club story. Um, continue, uh, not that one, not that strip club story. Continue, um, oh, it's the one from, oh, maybe we don't. Yeah, no, the, the oh. No, you gave, you gave me this is the one, this well. one and that one. Okay, well, um, so in Tampa, the night that Romney was accepting the nomination, I was, n again, not gonna have any access. And so instead of standing around, again, as the six millionth reporter, I went out to a strip club near the airport in Tampa and sat at the bar and talked to folks about the election, about what their lives were like, about what they were struggling with. And I got some wonderful stories that I could set against an unexpected backdrop, which is this, you know, this nightclub, but, and I spoke to dancers and patrons, and I found a lot of people who should have been Republican voters, like small business owners and people in the military, but who weren't, who didn't trust Mitt Romney. Um, and that was interesting. And then setting, juxtaposing the things that you find in the city against the convention itself, because the convention is you know, this ultimate power, il powerful elite event that, that's like, it's like an orgy of power. And so stories set in the city just a few miles from it um, are, often have a resonance uh, be, if, they're, if they're the left behind kind of people. Um, and so I think that's, that's a wonderful place to find stories. So now with a different perspective, uh, Ginger. Hi. Let me move forward. My name's Ginger. Um, I covered the 2012 Republican convention for Politico, and I was the embed in 2012 during the general election covering Mitt Romney. I went to 40 states in the course of the year. I flew on more than 150 commercial flights, and I lived out of a suitcase. So all of the tips about pre-planning and pre-preparing are great. But I could do none of those things. Um, I was lucky to know what day of the week it was by the time I got to Tampa, more or less have a story pre-reported. So I'm going to offer you a few uh, tips based on my experience on things that I think can help you, um, even if it means that you get dropped in Tampa like you fell on your head um, and you had no pre-planning done. So my first piece of advice would be really adaptable. Um, I flew into Tampa with Mitt Romney on his plane. Um, we came from Boston but we didn't know when we were going to get there. There was a hurricane. Um, they didn't tell us. Uh, they were trying to surprise the delegates and have them show up a day early. So basically, we were all sitting around Boston waiting to find out when we were going to leave. And I would say that even if you're not hopping a plane with Donald Trump or Ted Cruz or Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders, 
be prepared to change what you're doing at any moment. After we got to Tampa, they told us that we were going to fly to Indiana and spend a night in Indiana and then come back the next day because Romney was going to speak at a VFW convention. Instead, we went there and back in a day, and all of us were able to get back into the convention hall that night in time to see the primetime speeches. That meant that I was jumping in with almost no warning, uh, writing stories. And if you remember, Politico ran a live show, so they were putting us on camera throughout the entire convention. I literally got off the plane, drove to our studio, and got there. That means you have to be able to change your schedule. It was a great tip to get delegate schedules, as many as you can get if you're a local or a national reporter. There's going to be a lot of places to see these people. My recommendation is if you can, try to go to breakfast instead of the party. I know the after parties sound like lots of fun, but particularly in Tampa, the logistics were so bad, it was really difficult to get to any of the after parties. There was a complete lockdown of downtown. You couldn't drive. If if you were depending on a van, it couldn't take you. That might mean you had to walk an hour. I remember there was BuzzFeed had a party at the aquarium, and we all really wanted to go, and then we realized it was an hour walk to get there. Um, you'll get more out of your time if you're at the breakfasts with the delegates than if you're at the after parties. Um, yeah, they're a lot of fun, but people are awake. They're talking. They're wondering what's going to happen for the day. And there's just generally less reporters there. So you've got a lot more exclusivity. The other thing is that um, delegations will have different speakers come in for their breakfasts throughout the week. And if you can get this schedule and know that, say, Scott Walker is going to show up at the Pennsylvania delegation's breakfast on Thursday, and you want Walker, you can go to that event and get him. There is crossover. People have co-breakfasts. There's a lot of opportunity to meet people. So that would be my first piece of advice. Be adaptable, be able to move around, be able to switch up your, your schedule, and be able to take it as they come. Don't think there's going to be any hurricanes this time, but you never know. Um, Pennsylvania gets them. Um, so just be ready to move. My second piece of advice would be to really think outside of the box. Um, I covered a lot of those sort of stories of writing what the speaker on the floor was saying. I covered Mitt Romney's acceptance speech. Um, I covered Chris Christie's keynote the night before. Be looking for things that are different. There are hundreds of reporters writing the same story as you. And as you said, the Prepared remarks are often made available for you before the speech ever starts. So be looking for a different way to cover the same speech that everyone else is at and that everyone's watching on television. So one example I would give you is that I helped cover the Chris Christie speech, start reading through the speech. Herbal no, I'm familiar with, with Governor Christie. I covered him at the Star-Ledger. And I was struck by how often the word I and me appeared in the speech. Um, so before it was even halfway done, I had their prepared remarks, and I ran a word count. And I figured out how many times the word I and me appeared in the speech. And I figured how many times the words Mitt and Romney appeared in the speech. Um, and we put that line in our story on online before he was done speaking. Um, I tweeted it. It got picked up all over the place. And it made our story really distinctive. It had a different element than almost any of the other stories at that point because we were looking for a different angle. And I would say, especially if you're working at a regional paper, you've worked at regional papers, and you're now at a national paper, you're going to know some of the personalities. You're going to know how some of these people operate, what their speeches are like, so be looking for those little yarns, those little threads that you can pull out and really make your story distinctive. Um, you know, we were on the floor when Romney gave his speech. Um, along with several other reporters from my own news organization. Um, I love the idea of pre-reporting. I think that's really important if you can get it done. But if you can't, go look for unique voices. You know, we talked about floor passes. We talked about having a congressional handbook. The big piece of advice I would give you is have no embarrassment about asking someone who they are, right? Like, just assume they're all a bunch of hundred strangers. And if they get offended, they'll get over it. Um, so I would often walk up to people and be like, Hi, my name's Ginger. Who are you? Where are you from? And you're going to find with a lot of these delegates that they're happy to talk to you, that they're
they're there because they're excited about their candidate. And in Cleveland, we might have them excited about two different candidates. And that a lot of people want to weigh in. And I think you're going to find a lot of unique voices that can make your coverage really distinctive. Another thing that's important to remember as these delegates are people who are deeply involved in the politics and the operations of their own states. So some of them might be grandmas and doctors and dentists, but these are people who are paying attention to what's going on in the state party on a regular basis. They're the people who are showing up and volunteering. They're the people who are writing big checks. They're the people who are putting yards signs out. And so a lot of times they're going to be able to offer you insight that you didn't think you could get anywhere else and that are going to inform your reporting in great ways. So I think walking the floor, especially during those afternoon speakers when people start to show up, when they start to come into the convention halls, when they're still mostly sober, um, that they can provide you a lot of insight. So that would be a way I think you can really sort of make your copy stand out and be distinctive from everyone else. My final recommendation has to do with Clint Eastwood. Um, Many of you remember the Clint Eastwood chair speech at the Republican National Convention. I was on the floor. We had sat down. We were getting ready to cover it. And the room was really quiet. Um, And we looked around and we were like, no one's really responding or reacting to this speech. No one seems to really care. Um, And it made it really difficult for us in the room to gauge how weird it was, right? Like it was weird to us, but it was even weirder on TV. And so have really good ways where you can get perspective outside of the room. Um, I was texting with my brother, who is sort of a recreational political observer, and he was watching, and he was like, what is going on? This is the bizarrest thing I've ever seen. Got on Twitter and started looking at some of the Twitter response. You realize, and I think this is a great rule for campaigns entirely, because especially if you're covering a candidate day to day, if you're an embed, you start to get lost in this bubble where everything is the same, and you hear the same words all the time. And you would be shocked that this thing you've heard the candidates say a hundred bajillion times, so much so that you repeat it in your sleep, gets set at a convention and it sets off all these alarms and all these bells and all these whistles. Because people who have never seen it before are now interacting. And people who aren't in the room are seeing it in a different format. So my advice would be, Keep a worldview as as much as you can of what's going on. Have maybe, um, if you're in a regional newspaper setting, some folks who are local who are maybe watching it on home at home on television that you can send an email to, who are on the floor that you can send an email to, just to keep that perspective going. Because I think if there was no TV, if the Clint Eastwood thing had happened outside of prime time, all of us that were sitting on the floor would have been like, yeah, that was weird, and just kept going. Um, But when it exploded around us and we saw that all these people were making jokes about it and that it was really taking off, that informed our ability to report and made our stories even better and then allowed us to add all of the additional color from inside the room and all of the question from why the heck had they let this guy um, have an uh, unfettered access to the stage. So that's that would be my advice. Try to keep some type of perspective and some way to look at different things. Okay. So we have uh, time for questions. Um, I'm going to throw it out to you. Anybody uh, have some questions right now? Um, well, let me ask one to get started. Um, the You come from different news organizations. Could you talk a little bit about um, how what kind of support structure you had from your news organization? I mean, how many people were you, were you working with on the daily basis, you know, Ginger, Christina, and then, and, and how many people, what support structure did you have from the Post-Gazette, and did the Regional Reporters Association, does that offer any kind of support structure in a way? Um, Regional Reporters Association um, uh, offers some technical assistance and advice, and we are actually, um, I'm, I'm the secretary of RRA, um, we have a couple of events coming up actually um, with the uh, uh, chairman of um, each of the four, the, the DCCC, the, sorry, I forget all the acronyms, they get jumbled in my head, um, but those are coming up, and if you're a regional reporter, you can ask me or Herb or Joe or Jessica or Allison when they are, and we'll tell you. Um, so the Huffington Post sent probably 12 reporters to the convention, and we had our D.C. Bureau 
um, as well. So that was, I mean, we had all the tech help we would we needed, um, but with 12 of us, again, there was a lot of overlap. So we, need, you know, we traded floor passes to get in, so you'd go in for a little while in the afternoon. Um, but actually, I'd also love to follow up on something Ginger said um, about finding these these stories. Um, also, notice that sometimes the story is what's missing and not what's there. So, for instance, if during prime time in the evening um, a governor is speaking, look across the floor for the senators from his state, from the congressional delegation from his state, or vice versa if it's a senator speaking. And if you don't see them, perhaps look for the spouse. If you don't see them, ask why. And often there can be a very interesting story in who is missing from the stage or from a group. If you see every member, say, of a or all the leadership of a committee except one guy, um, there, you know, follow those up. So Politico had a very large footprint at the convention, as all of you would imagine. Um, we took nearly every political, we took every political reporter, most of our main side reporters, if you're, and then a lot of our pro reporters, which are much more numerous than they were even four years ago, all of our editorial structure. We had two uh, physical bases at the convention. Um, the way Tampa was set up was there was the convention hall and then across the street, there was another building where there were filing centers. Um, we had our own filing room in that space. And then in a building outside of the secure zone downtown, we had another newsroom. It's where they held their parties and it's where they filmed the daily show. I will say this from my vantage point, um, if you have a place you can work that's close, but outside the security perimeter, that was great. I know there were days where I wanted to catch a speech and I was able to just run into that building without having to deal with the security, which is a nightmare, um, have no doubt. It's like the TSA on steroids. Um, I was able to just go in there real quick and get a feed. Um, so it was nice to have two bases. I realize probably most of you won't have that type of setup. Um, in terms of, of support, we traded floor passes. You know, We did not have floor passes for everyone. We traded convention hall passes to get in and out, um, which is great because you can go in and, and have a purpose. And I actually, we were talking about this earlier, if you say, like, I need to go find this person, I need the pass to go find this person, that helps you, like, train your sights on what you're going to do and makes you more, like, mission-oriented, which I think is a really good thing. Um, but it's good to have a lot of people. It's also can be, I think, overlapping, but... Um, Again, you know, we had pro reporters there. I think everyone's familiar with Politico Pro um, that are covering very specific policy areas, and I, I'm sure some of you also have very specific policy areas. Those policy experts are there. There's lots of people there who want to talk about these issues that are business, that are donors, that are um, that are members of Congress, that are state officials. Um, and so you can find a lane to run in, whatever you want your lane to look like. Okay. If I could also follow up. The BuzzFeed party at the aquarium was amazing. You were allowed to touch a penguin. Um, but Ginger's absolutely right. Uh, the breakfasts are much better for reporting. Okay. Um, yeah, let's, let's go over here. Uh, I have a follow-up question for Tracy. It's a little bit off topic, but I'm curious. You mentioned some tips on how to dress if you're going to a protest. I'm curious if you have any other tips for how to stay safe but also get good coverage in that type of situation. Um, yes, I would say if you're expecting to be out covering protests, definitely have a plan before you get out there with your editor and perhaps your publications attorney about what you do if you get arrested because it could happen. It did happen to a reporter at the Post-Gazette during the G20. Um, you know it's happened in Ferguson and lots of other places. So just have a plan. Find out, like, what what are you supposed to say? What are you supposed to do? Who do you call? Um, I would also say buddy up with somebody um, out at a protest. Even, even if uh, you're the only person from your publication, just find another reporter or photographer uh, that's out there and just exchange information with them so that if one of you gets into trouble, they know how to reach your editor. And you can also, like, hand off your notes, your camera, whatever. It's better even to give your stuff to your competitor than it is to let the police have it because you don't know when. You'll, you'll get it back, probably, but you don't know when. Um, so, you know, it's better to, to just hand off where you, where you can. Um, 
I'll, apple cider vinegar helps if you get sprayed with tear gas. <laughs> I'll add, we, we've, my news organization has put us through hostile environment training for this very reason. Um, I, I have been through it. Um, I, I would say one, and this sounds ridiculous, but I've done it in covering protests in the past, phone number on the inside of your arm, permanent marker, right? Because I don't know the number of my editor or the lawyer or anyone, right? So write it on your arm. It'll come off with makeup remover once you get home if you don't need it, but you'll be happy it's there if you don't have your phone in your hand and you need to call someone. Um, my other big piece of advice would be there is nothing worth covering that's worth putting yourself in harm's way, right? So I don't care how much you want that picture or you want to watch it happen, back up another 10 feet. Um, I was at a particular presidential candidate's campaign rally that got out of hand um, last month. I was standing out out front, um, and I could see the police moving in and that it was getting kind of um, feisty, and I backed up. Um, it is against my inclination to run towards things that are exciting, right, because that's what I want to do. Um, but it's not worth it. Um, and I would say that if you start to feel uncomfortable, just turn around and walk back 10 feet. There's nothing you're not going to be able to see, and there's nothing worth getting that's worth standing there. Right. I mean, right. even if you get something great, but you get arrested in the process, you can't get the news out there or the photo out there. So, you know, you, yeah. you got to be smart. Um, I covered the the manhunt for the, the Boston bombers um, and Sandy Hook, both of which were heavy police presences. Park, if you're going into what could potentially become a protest, Park your car as far away as you possibly can um, because and walk the last, say, 10 blocks even because if you need to get out, often they'll be cordoning off areas of protest and if you need to get your car out, you could find yourself stuck, which a lot of people in Boston did. Um, yeah, do exactly what the police tell you to. Um, don't, I, you know, I said earlier, go, you know, go where the herd isn't, uh, go find stories. In this situation, if there could be danger, don't. Stick with the other reporters. I wandered off in Boston, and I ended up face down on the ground uh, with a, a cop pointing a gun at me and, uh, and was told to get out of there. But, so I learned my lesson, but it's, uh, yeah, stick with the other reporters. And in these situations, ID yourself, right? Wear your credentials around your neck. Um, make sure everyone knows who you are. In a protest situation, you're probably better off um, having the police know that that's who you are and that's what you're doing. And if they tell you to move, move. That's that's what I would do. Okay. So go over here. So I guess for an audience, um, just the general public, what do you think they would find from your perception kind of most shocking or most surprising from the conventions, like when you first show up there? Oh, jeez. I, there's always a way to make the party seem really outrageous to the average person, right? Like, um, I covered New Jersey, and they have this very infamous uh, League of Municipalities convention in Atlantic City every year. And the first time I went, I was like, this is why New Jersey has the reputation New Jersey has. There were, like, parties and scantily clad women, and it was, like, a thing. Um, I sometimes think that's cheap, right? Like, I think it's cheap. Um, I would think that some of them would be surprised how much substance actually shows up some of these things if you start talking to people. Um, but that's not going to get you probably very many clicks if that's what you're looking for. <laughs> um, but I would also say that that personal stories, right? Like, you're um, one of the things I'm struggling because I, I now, for Reuters, am covering the conventions as like a microbeat, so me and one of my colleagues are responsible for all things conventions. Um, and I, I find frustrating that people think of these delegates as robots that are just like, someone's going to press a button and they're all going to change their vote for Paul Ryan. Like, that's not how this works. They're all individual human beings. Um, and so I think there's a ton of personal stories and personal motivations and personal interactions, um, both on the ups, where people just think they're going to make the world a better place, and on the top total like shady side where people are like trading board commissions for delegate votes probably I don't know that to be true but it could happen so I think that like those personal stories are a great thing that that people want to read yeah I mean I I think I would agree I, th I think people would also be surprised by how, how scripted it is um, yeah there are no surprises so if there is a surprise um, you know familiarize yourself with exactly what's supposed to happen and when, and if anything goes off script, that's a story that you should file fast. One more thing that readers like, and and 
I covered the Republican convention, but I've covered Democrats as well. Um, the celebrities at the Republican convention are way more accessible than at the Democratic convention. The Democratic convention, they show up and they're like, I'm a celebrity and I'm going to go sit in this box over here. At the Republican convention, they show up, I'm a celebrity and please someone talk to me because no, there's no other celebrities here. There's just less of them. John Voight was like the most accessible person at the Republican <laughs> convention in Tampa. We like almost couldn't get him to go away. Um, but you could have interviewed him every day on any topic and he was happy to talk to you and like readers love that stuff. Um, there's also always a story in um, in how much the, the convention is using in terms of resources. Um, my colleague Dave Jamison wrote some great stories. He interviewed the, the sanitary workers who were cleaning up at the end of the night and you know again you have this orgy of power and the stories of the people who are making it happen or how much it's costing or how many zillions of paper cups are being thrown out um, is a story that often puts readers right there. Um, questions? Um, yeah, go ahead, Chen. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, I just I write for a medical website, so I have a very different job than most people who are covering states or national. So um, I'm wondering if you have any advice in terms of if you're looking outside the convention, should I be talking to hospitals and doctors in the area ahead of time about their issues, or should I mainly be focusing on, you know, policy groups? Is is there a human story in the like the little man on sort of on the side? So I would I would be looking for the trade associations that you cover and what events they're sponsoring because they're sure to have events. Most of them do. Um, I would also be looking for. I mean. It, at a convention, there's going to be a lot of advocates on policy issues. I mean, it's also like a giant lobbying fest, right? Like, all of these decision makers are there. So members that have views, uh, knowing which members you're looking for, states that have fights over policy issues, you're going to be able to get a whole bunch of people in a state delegation to be able to talk about, um, you know, an issue on nurse practitioners' independent practice in um, Ohio and a question about um, medical device taxes, which is national, and a question about um, other types of medical issues in each individual state. So I would say that's a good way to approach some of that. Um, I think there's, you know, I said earlier for policy avenues, there's a, a wealth of access to information. And any issue that you would be writing about on a national level, you're going to find someone who's going to be able to talk about it there. Um, platform planks, I would get really, um, if there's medical issues th that are going to come up in a platform plank, um, there are 150. 12 um, or 116 uh, platform committee members that are selected in the same way that the rules committee members are, which are getting all the attention right now, but the platform committee plays a big role. Um, I would be looking for those people about what type of policy planks they're going to be putting in there because they're going to be able to talk about them and they're going to be intimately involved in that decision making. And then when you find, when you know what those policy planks are, um, there is certainly a story to be written in going and figuring out what the biggest issues facing that city's hospital system and medical system, whether it's underfunding or a lack of EMTs um, or a lack of available blood supplies and juxtaposing the, the issue that is facing that particular city or that particular system with what the party that is a mile away would do about it. It's probably also a good story, not not so policy oriented. So I don't know if it's a story for you, but um, you know, checking in at the hospitals and emergency rooms are, are are people showing up with injuries from, I don't know, protest, heat exhaustion, whatever. Um, I got a question. We, we talked a lot about pre, you know preparing and planning ahead of of the stories, of all the stories that you did, all the content that you produced during the conventions. Would you say? Most of it was reactive news, or was most of it the kind of the stuff, the planned stuff you knew you were going to be covering going in, and you can kind of write the B matter ahead of time? So for me, it was mostly reactive. I mean, I, I, the life of an embed, you, you just wake up every morning and hope you, like, survive the day. Um, and, and sort of when you get to the convention, you're in this bubble, and all of a sudden the bubble collides with the rest of the political world. And you're like, thank God there's someone here to help me, right? <laughs> um, and I don't have to sit around and worry that the candidate's going to, like, fall off a cliff every moment of the day, because that's sort of what an embed does. Um, so I think a lot of it was reactive. The other thing I would say 
Um, and, and it's always a good thing to be thinking about whether you work for an online publication or a traditional newspaper is multimedia. So I did a lot of video at the convention. I did a lot of on-camera stuff. Um, Politico was really good and really pushing that. Um, Reuters now, we have an app. Um, I covered Iowa and did stand-ups in Des Moines in January and February with a selfie stick and a lapel mic um, that we put on our app and it went all over the world. It got thousands of views. Um, so that's reactive, but be thinking, what can I do um, that's using multi-platforms? Because it's not just print, it's not just online, it's it's everything. You could record a podcast, or you could um, send video dispatches, or you could post Snapchat, or any other myriad of things. Yeah, my work was almost entirely reactive, just because it was a different kind of, our White House reporters are our, the people who cover Congress were writing the the pre-written speech stories, and that wasn't what I had access to. So I was I, I had the opposite problem that, that Ginger had, but um, I had to go out and find things that were that would be surprising to people, um, and find find stories that had a lot of look logistical details to them and human details um, in order to put readers in the room or at the table. Um, I would say for me it was a, a pretty good mix. I would say probably leaning a little bit more toward um, enterprise things that I had really um, planned for. Um, but there was some reactive coverage. Um, we had two reporters um, at the conventions, and the way we sort of split up the work was that he did more of the reactive stuff and I did more of the, like, more issue pieces. Um, but then on the speech nights, we kind of reversed that. Um, and I would put out a quick, um, like, breaking news web burst about the, the latest speech, like, just as quick as I possibly could. And he did a more thoughtful, contextual piece for our print edition. So every night, I would pretty much file, like, three or four um, breaking news um, think maybe like six or eight inches, um, one about each speech. And you do get the speeches. Um, up, uh, I guess I'm not on the right email list because I didn't, at least in 2012, I didn't get very many of them emailed to me. But there is um, a table at the conventions where you can go and grab the speeches. Like they'll bring copies of the speeches. It's near where the, the reporter's area is. Um, so you can grab it. Um, and sometimes you get it an hour or more before, and sometimes you get it five minutes before, and sometimes you don't get it at all. So, I, If I remember correctly, the the way they did it at Tampa was there was, like, an email list you signed up for that, like, basically when you got your credentials, you went on the list, and they were sending out prepared remarks that the speaker had made available to the convention organizers. And then if you wanted Romney's speech or you wanted Christie's speech, a lot of times you had to go through their shops because they just weren't getting them over to the folks fast enough to send them out to you to be of any use, um, at which case then you can go get them on your own. And, like, don't ever be afraid to ask any of these people for everything because they should be giving it to you because that's their job. So, like, email everyone all the time and just ask them to give it to you. And if I think I remember correctly, I think we got transcriptions after the fact, um, that was like the transcription service was transcribing them, but I don't remember exactly. It's a long time ago. Okay. Uh, any more questions from out in the audience? Okay. Well, I think that's uh, what we're going to have the time for May this I morning. One more thing. Oh, sure. Christina, please. Um, it will be roasting hot outside. It will be freezing cold inside the convention. Um, make sure for women wearing dresses that you have pockets um, to put things in and put Foam things inside, for women and men, inside your shoes because you will be on your feet for 14 hours a day. And try to have fun. It can be, like, it can be, like this is the other thing I would say. It's all, if you go in and you think, I'm going to be at parties and I'm going to be sipping, sipping champagne all night, you're going to be sorely disappointed. But if you go in and be like, this is going to be fun and I'm going to run around the convention hall, I'm going to talk to a million people and I'm going to write the best stories that I can write, and you have that mentality going in, you're going to have a ton of fun and it'll be a blast.